when the heavy rains come, these streams and even lakes you know, that used to be here before humans were here re-emerge. This is 100 Years, 100 Objects. Stories from the collections of Lancaster City Museums. I'm Millie Wellborn, a museum assistant for Lancaster City Museums, and today we'll be looking at the stories behind another object from our collections as we celebrate 100 years of our museums. Today we are looking at a photograph of a place that many people from Lancaster will find familiar, but it might not be immediately recognisable, especially because of the stream that can be seen running across the road. Today's object is a photograph of Haler Hill in the 1920s. The photograph shows a road junction in the Haler area of Lancaster around 1927. At that time, Haler was a small collection of buildings outside the village of Scotforth. This view looks up Haler Hill with a collection of white buildings known as the Potteries to the left of the road. In front of those buildings, a stream can be seen running across the road and creating a ford, which travellers must cross if they want to continue their journey. This is Borough Beck, and it will be the focus of our episode today. Borough Beck is just one of the streams that flows, or used to flow, through the Lancaster area. Many are still there, but do not play such a large part in our lives anymore. Others do not flow today, but they still leave their mark on the landscape. We spoke to Bronisław Szyszynski, Professor of Sociology at Lancaster University, to find out more about these watercourses, which have helped shape this area. I think one thing that's really interesting about this photo is that most people who live in Lancaster wouldn't guess where it was without a caption. It's actually a very familiar view today for anyone who visits Booths, for example, in Scotforth. It's looking east up what's now known as Haler Hill, and probably then was still called Haler Hill, I think. But it's showing a ford over Borough Beck and then the road goes up the hill. The road today doesn't follow quite the same course. They've done a kind of a dog leg, you know, so if you get to the 100 bus, it sort of goes a dog leg up Haler Hill. They've changed the road layout when they did that estate. But I think once you start staring at it, you might recognise that skyline, although the trees we see today, familiar trees on the skyline, aren't there yet. And the building on the other side of the stream... There was a ceramic works there, presumably took water from the stream. I mean, one thing I like about it is it's a reminder that once upon a time there weren't so many bridges and there were fords everywhere. You know, when the Romans settled and built their fort in Lancaster, there would have been a ford over the Loon. It was a, a good fording place and that's why the fort was there. And then later on there was another ford across the Loon, a little bit downstream at Saltair, which is marked on some of the old maps. And similarly, as I understand it, Scott Forth was originally the Scots Ford, so there would have been another ford on what's now the A6 going down towards the university where it crosses Borough Beck on a bridge. There would have been a ford there. People would have encountered fords across all the streams constantly, having to wade through, drive their horses and carts through. With a stream like Borough Beck, which is very changeable, sometimes very low and slow, sometimes fast and fierce, that would have made a big difference whether you could get across there. So that's the first thing, is just how much the streams have become invisible. Some of them we might not be even be aware of because they're under culverts or, or under bridges and we pass them all the time. And we, so we're much less aware of the, the streams that are kind of rushing through and are shaping the landscape around us. Some of the streams in Lancaster and the surrounding area have been redirected or culverted, but Borough Beck, which you can see in this image, hasn't and still flows openly through Haler. We asked Bronnie Suave about Burrowbeck, how it and other streams have shaped the area, and how humans have gone on to use and reshape the local streams. Well, firstly, I think it's too lively a stream because of the way it's fed by a number of tributaries that come down that hill that you can see. 
It's very volatile. But also, I think people like it as well. It's a very nice presence, and kids can play in it and things like that. Although I know that people who live around there are mainly concerned about it because of the, of the way it floods, not just the stream itself, but the little streams that feed into it that come down from up near the motorway, you know, which can sometimes flood people's back gardens as well, which is very different from some of the other streams in Lancaster, which would have to work very hard to flood anything, <laughs> They're little trickles, you know. The first thing to say is I don't think there's anything special about the streams in Lancaster and their, their role. Because we're so close to the Lake District, they're flowing across a landscape that was shaped by the glaciers and their retreat at the end of the last ice age 12,000 years ago. So it means that when the, the ice retreated, the water had to find its way to the sea across a landscape which, they, which the streams hadn't shaped, you know, unlike other landscapes which are where the streams shape efficient ways, create their own valleys and uh, meanders to find their way to the sea. The water in this landscape, after the ice retreated, had to find often a very zigzag way around all these drumlins and piles of gravel that had been dropped by the melting glaciers to find their way to the sea. So Burrowbeck originally flowed from past where the Moor Hospital was and then down through Haler out to the Loon. It powered a corn mill and, and a sawmill like near Moorside School. And there was a massive mill pond there where the park is now. Then there was another brook, which is hard to, to see now because it only really flows west of the canal where it's known as Stodde Pool and it used to power a, a snuff mill there. But that originally flowed from near the point around about, but then that got swallowed up and culverted and disappeared when the canal came and then the railway came and then the urbanisation. So there's very little sign of it now. Lucy Brook still flows through the Fairfield Association land, but originally it flowed from somewhere near up near the castle, so it might have been like a spring that maybe the Romans used when they had their fort, but it certainly used to flow along near Dallas Road. But this is not all the streams across Lancaster. Ronnie Swerve told us a few more of the key watercourses of the area, and also why he finds them so interesting. A bit further north, there's Jellybeck, or Jollybeck it was called in uh, medieval and early modern times, which flows from up near the sort of boys' grammar playing fields, through Miss Wally's field in Freehold, and then out under where B&M Bargains is, and that sort of area, and where it joined, now joins the mill race. Nowadays, a lot of people, locals, call it the River Midge, I think it's because of all the midges and flies. Many of these streams formed parts of the boundary of the old township of Lancaster, and Jellybeck was one of those. Newton Beck flows through the Claver Hill community growing project, where it was culverted, but they've opened it out and have re-landscaped it, and that used to have a water, a water mill on it. But they're very different characters. Like I say, Burrowbeck is very lively and can be very floody, whereas Lucy Brook is... A lot of the places it hardly flows at all. It's very gentle in its upper reaches. The one that flowed from the pointer is kind of like a ghost stream now. It only flows right down at the bottom. One thing that I like is the way that with a lot of these streams, there are community groups that have formed a kind of relationship with them in one way or another, whether it's the flood action group for Burrowbeck or the Fairfield Association, who are trying to sort of restore wetlands around Lucy Brook, or the Claver Hill people, and also the Miss Wally's Field people, finding new ways to relate to, to streams. Next, we discovered how the route of the streams and becks actually helped shape the town itself, along with some of the interesting methods our predecessors had of remembering exactly how the water fitted the shape of the town. The boundary of Lancaster Township, so the boundary between it and Scotforth to the south, but also to Bulk, a separate township to the north, as well as following the river, the boundary often followed streams 
and indeed that's one of the ways in which I discovered the course of these old streams that don't exist anymore because the the boundary you could still see on the on the maps following the, the where the stream used to be so that was something that was important before we had gps and accurate maps people had to find different ways to remember where the township boundary was and so every 10 years or so a group of dignitaries and officials and just local hangers-on and children would beat the bounds, you know, ride around the boundaries, which would often involve taking a boat across the river, but also knowing where the boundary joined a stream and where it left it. And there's some really nice accounts of the way local children were sort of ritually ducked into the water at, at critical points, you know, where the boundaries uh, joined and left the stream in order to, to remind them so they remember in future where, where the boundary was. And then they were they were rewarded with uh, halfpennies afterwards, apparently, to make them feel a bit better about it. So I think that's one thing. It was It was knowing where the boundaries were. And obviously people were having to navigate them to get across them because of the lack of bridges and culverts that we take for granted today. When Bronisław spoke to the public about his work, he also found that there were more emotional and either mythical ways that people still related to the streams around them. One thing that I found interesting when some of my research was published on Facebook was it was really nice the way that people responded with their own stories. Uh, So a lot of them were to do with when they were young, playing in streams at different places. So Lucy Brook uh, in Freeman's Wood, people were talking about Bottle Island, which is apparently an island made of old bottles that they used to play on. So they had their local names for places and the names for the stream, like I mentioned, the River Midge. But also a lot of them told the story of Jenny Greenteeth. There's a folk tale that parents would tell their children, like, don't get too near the canal or near the stream or the river because Jenny green teeth lurks in the river and she'll come out and get you and pull you under the water so this is a very sort of local or regional folk tale that's been passed through the generations and also a lot of people told me stories about their cellars flooding and the stories of underground rivers it's rarely the case that it's really an underground river going through like an underground caverns in, in rocks like ours. It's more like our cellars are often under the water table, so they flood. But I think a lot of people have these stories that are, and pass on these stories of underground rivers, which is a kind of way of making sense of, of, of the way that water comes up through the ground. And so a lot of people shared really interesting stories. To finish this story, Bronisław told us about how the way the water flows around our landscape has changed and how important it is to still be aware of how water exists in our landscapes and in our lives. The way our streams and also the River Loon behave is affected by changes in the use of the land which feeds water into these watercourses. Deforestation and management of moors for grouse shooting and things like that really affect the way these streams behave. And I think when developments are being planned, I think we need to be a lot more aware of the whole catchment behaviour. Of course, some of the streams I'm talking about are, are, are kind of what you might call ghost streams in that there's, there's no actual channel anymore. You can just maybe detect them in the shape of the land as you walk around. You can see that there was once a stream, like, for example, Bowram School is on a little dip, which obviously fed a stream going down towards that pointer stream. That's long gone. But as we know around here, when the heavy rains come, these streams and even lakes you know, that used to be here before humans were here re-emerge out of the land because the shape of the land sort of brings them back. Streams and lakes that we haven't seen for hundreds or even thousands of years temporarily come back. It would be really good, I think, if we were, were more aware of the way that the land remembers these old streams and lakes. One thing that's very different about the way we live with water today on a planet which is becoming very much shaped by human activity is the emergence of what we might call artificial streams in agriculture, digging of drains to drain land, pilling that kind of filed area. A lot of the fields around here were very, very damp and and now they've been drained. And then also the mill race, of course, is like an artificial stream that was created along the river to power the water mill at the bottom of Lancaster. And then the sewage system in the 19th century. And then, of course, when Maine's water came to Lancaster, it was in effect an artificial 
stream that ran from the Wiresdale Fells purely by gravity all the way to Lancaster. And then the canal in the 1790s, it was a kind of artificial stream or a very long, thin lake, if you like, where people could simulate what was possible on the larger streams and the river and, and so on. And now, of course, we have storm drains of the modern water system. So I think, in a way, the old natural streams that emerged after the ice retreated 12,000 years ago and now have to live alongside all these artificial streams, a lot of which night intersect with them or may even pollute them at certain times but a lot of the time just takes the water away that would have fed them but it's interesting that even when those occurred when we built the artificial stream as it were the pipe system that brought Maine's water people still had a real sense of connection that each year apparently civic dignitaries they would go on a big inspection tour of pipes and reservoirs, taking picnic hampers and lots of wine and going off in horses and carriages and things. So a kind of celebration, if you like, of, of our connectedness with the flows of water across the landscape. We need to find new ways of celebrating the flows of water around both the ones that happen naturally but also the ones that we have done through our own ingenuity so that we don't take it all for granted and just pay the bill by direct debit and then just forget about how we're connected with these flows of water. Thank you for taking the time to listen to this episode of 100 Years, 100 Objects. We hope you will meander through history with us again in other episodes where we talk about everything from postcards to prisoners of war.